I remember growing up as a kid in the early 90s, I used to thumb through popular science and popular mechanics and awe at the future's promise of the piss-powered car. Now, some of those predictions did in fact come true. For example, now everyone thinks an edited piece of narration with a slightly harsh cut is automatically now an AI voice. But anyways, there is one surprising, amazing technology from the future that seems to be showing promise. Here's a video on jetpacks. The idea of personal flight has been firmly planted in the public consciousness since the late 19th century, though not by engineers, but storytellers. By the 1920s, it was a common trope to envision a future where individuals could fly with personal devices with jetpack wearing heroes quickly becoming a part of popular culture. This created a sense of technological destiny that transformed the jetpack from an abstract engineering concept into a symbol of the future. The first documented attempt at bringing the idea into reality dates back to 1919 in a crude oxygen methane rocket wing design by Russian inventor Alexander Fedorovich Andreev. By the end of World War II, the cultural fascination coincided with the very real and practical interest from the US military. The United States Army Transportation Research Command began to explore novel ways to increase mobility of individual soldiers on the battlefield. Planners envisioned a personal lift device that could allow a soldier to perform reconnaissance, cross rivers and minefields, and navigate steep terrain with unprecedented speed and agility. From this, the Small Rocket Lift Device, or SRLD, was devised. The first steps towards a functional SRLD began as a series of experimental prototypes derived from existing promising designs. In 1952, working with a small amount of army funding, engineer Thomas Moore developed the Jet Vest, an impulse device powered by various experimental stored and generated gases that successfully lifted him a few feet into the air for a few seconds. Though the project was soon abandoned due to a lack of funds, it served as an important proof of concept. A different approach was taken in 1958 by Thiokol Corporation engineers with their jump belt, also known as Project Grasshopper. This device used jets of high-pressure compressed nitrogen to propel the wearer in powerful leaps, allowing a user to jump 20 feet high and cover 300 feet in just 9 seconds. While not true sustained flight, the jump belt was a more mechanically simple and achievable step towards personal mobility. By 1959, a technological direction was honed in when the Army contracted Aerojet General to conduct a feasibility study for the SRLD. Aerojet's research concluded that the most suitable propulsion system would be an engine running on the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide. In these engines, relatively stable pure hydrogen peroxide is put in contact with a catalyst via a silver screen coated with samarium nitrate, causing it to decompose into a mixture of superheated steam and oxygen in less than 100 microseconds, rapidly increasing in volume 5,000 times. The resulting steam gas mixture reached around 740 degrees Celsius and is used directly as the reaction mass, ejecting through the engine's jet nozzles. This configuration has the advantage of being mechanically simple and being relatively safe as it was not flammable on its own. Piecing all this jetpack history together is a huge organizational challenge. That's why for this very video, my browser of choice has been Opera. It's been a massive help in organizing my workflow. Opera is a calmer, more sensible approach to the browser experience with an organized approach to tabs that just makes sense, media control that integrates elegantly, and a look that feels right. Let me show you what I mean. When I'm researching a topic with so many different eras and inventors, I used to have a pile of scattered tabs. Now with tab islands, I can group related tabs together like one one island for military jetpack development and another for its commercial and entertainment uses. It's just a really natural way to keep decades of history organized and I can collapse and expand them to save space. See these subtle underscores beneath the tabs? The darker ones show you most recently visited pages. When I'm going down a research rabbit hole on a specific engineer, these trace tabs help me quickly retrace my steps back to that original patent filing or key article. Sometimes I need to compare information within patents. Opera's split screen is brilliant for this. Simply drag one tab down and you've got two primary sources 
browsers open side by side. No more painful jumping between windows to fact check a piece of information. And here's something that really sets Opera apart, the floating music player. I can place my music controls exactly where I want them, even outside the browser window. It's perfect for staying focused while keeping my music going. And while we're on staying focused, the Aurora theme gives everything a modern fluid feel that's clean and easy on the eyes. Need something more personal? Well, the entire theme of your browser can be changed, including animated backgrounds, UI colors, browser sounds, and more. For me, when I need a quick fact check on a date or get sucked into a tangent on a related topic, I bring up Aria, Opera's built-in AI tool. I can access Aria's command line with a few simple keys. Aria can also create an image based on a written description, helping me visualize what a lost prototype might have looked like. And it can even pull information from an image like text from an old grainy photograph. Opera has completely streamlined my research workflow, so give it a try. Check out the link in the description below. In August 1960, now with a focus on hydrogen peroxide engines, the Army turned to the Bell Aircraft Corporation and its proven experience with rocket propulsion to develop the SRLD. Leading the project was Wendell F. Moore, who had worked on the rocket systems for the sound barrier breaking X-1. The primary challenge faced by Bell was not generating thrust but achieving stable, controllable flight, as the human body turned out to be an inherently unstable platform. Moore's team began with a tethered rig powered by compressed nitrogen, allowing them to experiment with nozzle arrangements and control systems in a safe environment. Ultimately, a design that used two nozzles that generated around 300 pounds of thrust that was mounted by a ball and socket joint to the upper part of a glass plastic corset was chosen. Moore himself served as the first test pilot, but his flight testing was cut short on February 17, 1961, when a tether broke and he fell, fracturing his kneecap. His replacement was fellow engineer Harold Graham, who took over the test flights and quickly mastered the device. After dozens of tethered practice flights, on the morning of April 20th, 1961, at a field near the Niagara Falls Airport, Harold Graham strapped on the 125-pound Bell rocket belt and for the first time in history, achieved sustained, untethered, controlled flight with an integrated propulsion system. The flight lasted just 13 seconds, though some claim 21 seconds, and covered a distance of 112 feet at an altitude of about 4 feet, but it propelled the rocket belt into the global spotlight. It was demonstrated for President Kennedy in the Pentagon courtyard for military brass at Fort Eustis and became a fixture of air shows and public events. It became a technological icon in 1965 when it was featured in Thunderball. It also made appearances on Lost in Space. Despite its success, the Bell Rocket Belt was defined by an inescapable and fatal flaw, its limited endurance. Those 21 seconds of flight consumed 5 gallons of highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide. This hard limit was a direct result of the energy density and the maximum weight capacity a person could carry. After investing around $150,000, the military ultimately accepted that the device was useless for combat and cancelled the SRLD contract. Despite the setbacks, Bell would reapproach personal flight with a new contract with DARPA to develop a new jetpack, this time based on a turbine engine. This project was called the Jet Belt and once again managed by Wendell Moore, though with John K. Holbert, a specialist in gas turbines, working closely on the project. Williams Research Corporation in Wald Lake, Michigan, designed and built a new jet engine to Bell's specifications in 1969. It was called the WR-19 and had a rated thrust of 430 pounds and weighed just 68 pounds. The jet belt first flew free on April 7, 1969 at the Niagara Falls Municipal Airport, with pilot Robert Corder achieving a 330-foot circle at an altitude of 23 feet, reaching a speed of 28 miles an hour. Subsequent flights achieved up to 5 minutes, though theoretically the pack could fly for 25 minutes at up to 84 miles an hour. The jet belt was powered by a small, vertically mounted turbofan engine with a downward air intake. Its airflow was divided with one stream entering the combustion chamber and a second bypass stream mixing with the hot turbine gases to cool the exhaust and protect the pilot. This exhaust was then funneled into two pipes with steerable nozzles. Much like the rocket belt, the pilot maneuvered by deflecting the nozzles. The pack used kerosene from tanks mounted beside the engine and was started with a powder cartridge. It was equipped with engine monitoring instruments, a radio for telemetry, and a parachute that was only effective above 66 feet. 
Interestingly, this engine technology became the basis for the propulsion unit in the Tomahawk cruise missile. Despite its successful tests, the US Army ultimately lost interest in the jet belt. The pack was deemed too heavy and complex to maintain, while potentially catastrophic turbine blade failure and the hazards of landing with its weight made it too dangerous for the pilot. All work on the project concluded after engineer Wendell Moore died in May 1969. Bell then sold the sole prototype complete with its patents and technical documents to Williams Research Corporation. While earthbound personal flight slowly became a novelty, the space shuttle program saw promise in the concept during its evolution in the 1980s. NASA identified an operational need for astronauts to perform untethered extra vehicle activities or EVAs and the solution was the Manned Maneuvering Unit or MMU, a self-contained backpack propulsion system. The concept was not entirely new. The US Air Force had developed a similar device called the Astronaut Maneuvering Unit or AMU in the 1960s, which was slated for testing during the Gemini 9A mission, though the test was aborted. The MMU of the 1980s was a more refined system propelled by jets of cold gaseous nitrogen stored in two high-pressure tanks. On February 7, 1984, during the 10th Space Shuttle mission, the MMU made its historic debut. Astronaut Bruce McCandless exited the payload bay of the Shuttle Challenger and became the first human to fly untethered in space, venturing as far as 320 feet from the shuttle. Because of the microgravity, MMUs were incredibly efficient. The MMU's two tanks contained a total of just 26 pounds of nitrogen, providing enough propellant for a six-hour EVA through 24 nozzle thrusters placed at different locations on the MMU. The MMU was used on a total of three shuttle missions in 1984, being used to successfully capture, repair, and redeploy faulty communication satellites. Despite these successes, the unit was retired from use after its third mission. The high risk associated with untethered EVAs combined with shifting mission priorities led NASA to favor the use of the shuttle's robotic arm for more external tasks. A much smaller successor, the Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue, or SAFER, was introduced in 1994, designed not for routine work but as an emergency-only device to allow an astronaut who became detached to return to the spacecraft. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, Breakthroughs in inexpensive miniaturized turbojets were pioneered by German engineer Kurt Schreckling and Britain's Jerry Jackman, predominantly for hobby use. These home-built engines demonstrated that self-sustaining gas turbines could be radically miniaturized and simplified. Schreckling's popular KJ66 design, for example, utilized an automotive turbocharger's compressor and became the blueprint for dozens of other designs. These hobbyist-driven innovations laid the groundwork for the first wave of commercial engines. Companies like Advanced Microturbines in the Netherlands were among the first to transition these designs into commercially available products in the mid-1990s. By the 2000s, the abundance of low-cost embedded computing allowed for the digital control of these simple engines, creating a massive leap in their performance, usability, and reliability. Known as Full Authority Digital Engine Control, or FADEC, these systems monitor parameters like turbine speed RPM, engine gas temperature, and throttle commands in real time. From this, the FADEC precisely manages the fuel pump and ignition, eliminating complex and often unreliable manual procedures and attention to operational limitations required of early engines. Today, companies like PBS Aerospace, JetCat, and Williams International produce a wide range of micro jet engines for various applications such as for drones and small aircraft use that incorporate materials and manufacturing techniques used in some of their full-sized counterparts. With the emergence of microjet engines, the modern renaissance in personal flight would begin in the mid-2000s with wing packs. The first successful jet-powered wing pack was developed by Swiss ex-military and commercial pilot Yves Rossi in the early 2000s. His design was based on an 8-foot carbon fiber wing with four small kerosene-burning JetCat P400 jet engines. The $200,000 system is unique in that the pilot's body acts as the fuselage and provides flight control surfaces, with maneuvering accomplished through body movements and a hand throttle. A heat-resistant suit similar to that of a firefighter's and carbon fiber heat shields were also required to protect the EVE from hot jet exhaust. Unlike previous jetpack experiments, the flight process required a plane to take the system to altitude where the engines were ignited just before exiting the aircraft with the wings folded. 
The wings then unfolded during freefall, enabling stable horizontal flight. The system is described as highly responsive, requiring precise engine alignment and pilot control to prevent an uncontrolled spin. Rossi had conducted tests in Spain and made his first major public demonstration on May 14, 2008, with a six-minute flight near Lake Geneva, during which he performed loops and gained 2,600 feet of altitude. On September 26, 2008, he flew across the English Channel from France to England in just 9 minutes and 7 seconds, reaching speeds of up to 190 miles an hour. Within a few years, several other variations of the jet-powered wing pack of varying success would emerge. Some used rigid wings, others power foils, and some even attempted to use the human form as a lifting body. By the 2010s, a century's worth of jetpack aspiration would finally manifest with the first true viable personal flight device, the JB-9 by Jetpack Aviation. Based in California, Jetpack Aviation was founded by Australian inventor David Maimon in collaboration with Nelson Tyler, a veteran engineer who had worked on the Bell rocket belt. In November 2015, Maimon piloted the JB-9 on a flight around the Statue of Liberty. Powered by twin vector thrust AMT Nike jet engines, the JB-9 carried just 10 pounds of fuel, consuming up to a gallon per minute of fuel at maximum thrust, though flight times of up to 10 minutes were possible. Its performance included an initial climb rate of 500 feet per minute, which doubled as fuel was spent, and a top speed of 64 miles an hour. The control system is intuitive and based on the Bell rocket belt, with tilting hand grips that vector the engine thrust for movement, twisting left control for yaw, and a right twist throttle grip. Jetpack Aviation would achieve the first commercial sales of a jetpack system for military medic use. Their design would evolve in subsequent models to include upgraded electronics, more fuel flexibility, and variants that range from twin high-powered microjets to up to eight lower thrust jets to target either speed or runtime respectively. Currently, the jet suit concept is being explored by a handful of competing designers, such as iJetpack Aeronautics. Though their high cost, limited runtime, and engine lifespan has limited their appeal to mostly search and rescue applications. In the effort to create personal flight devices without relying on microjet engines, two other major propulsion strategies have been developed, ducted fans and electric multi-copter systems. The ducted fan approach was demonstrated by the Martin Jetpack which used a V4 two-stroke gasoline engine to drive a pair of large ducted fans that enhances efficiency at lower speeds. This configuration allows for theoretical flight times of up to 30 minutes, but in practice the system was commercially unsuccessful, largely due to its immense weight and mechanical complexity. The most recent and promising evolution in personal flight is the emergence of all-electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. These machines typically use a multi-copter design with numerous propellers powered by individual electric motors drawing from a central lithium-ion battery. This electric architecture results in quiet, emission-free flight with exceptional stability and simple joystick controls managed by a flight computer. Currently, a Jetson 1 is priced at $120,000, about one-third the price of the cheapest microjet-powered flight pack though delivery of ordered units is slated for 2027. While not as integrated as a jetpack, the personal electric aircraft, particularly in an ultralight package, may ultimately bring personal flight under $100,000 and open the doors to broader reaching consumer access within the near future. <laughs>